Um, so I'm from Mount Allison University, which is a fairly small university um, in the part of Canada that most Canadians don't know about. Uh, that's actually a good thing. It uh, means people have mostly left me alone. And one of the things they left me alone to do was to set up the Mount Allison Lyme Disease Research Network, which is a group of not only biologists and not only scientists, but we reached out. I reached out to my social sciences and humanities colleagues. So we're an uh, interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary group. We're united by three main principles. Uh, one is that we have to be compliant with ethical guidelines, and you would think that that would not be something you'd need to specify. But in fact, uh, it became a problem because we were challenged, not because of what we did, but uh, other people saying that they didn't need to obey ethical rules, so we thought we'd make a point of it. Um, the other thing that we that distinguishes us is that at all points of our research, we involve patients, we involve medical clinicians, and we have researchers, so it's not just tokenism. The Lyme community is an in integral part of our research. That's now expanded nationally to the Canadian Lyme Disease Consortium. Okay, so when I was starting this up, this is all a bit of a preamble, but uh, our patient partners from the Canadian Lyme Disease Foundation made the observation, they who have the samples have the power. So they said, well, why don't you do a biobank? And so I started with a tick biobank, and we've got several, oops. We now have several thousand tick species, uh, samples of various different species, DNA, protein, metadata, images. Then went into a dog sera collection, horse sera cow, uh, cultures of bacteria, Borrelia from cow milk, uh, wildlife tissue bank, um, human, human biobank, human serobank, highly, um, highly pedigreed from different disease classes, uh, Lyme disease and Lyme-like diseases, and we're branching out into the Canadian version of the My Lyme data, which is the Canadian Lymescape. So those resources are available to um, other researchers who are willing to not violate ethical concerns, which is the basis on which I've had to deny requests from some IDSA researchers. What I'm going to talk to you about today is a small study looking at tissue samples from Lyme disease patients. Okay. Uh, so the goal of this study was to develop some molecular tools that could be used to look at Lyme disease in human tissues. Uh, these were autopsy samples, which I personally found quite diff difficult to work with. Uh, but uh, the request was made in one case by the donor before his death and the other case by his family members. And confirmation of Lyme disease or not has at least given them closure to some extent. So the point of molecular diagnostics versus serology is that it allows direct detection of pathogen. Uh, by sequencing, we can also identify the Borrelia species, and we're not restricted to only working with seropositive individuals. We can, this works just as well on seronegative individuals. So the methodology is very straightforward. You get tissue that can be human tissue, animal tissue, can be biopsy, can be autopsy. Um, I'm a typical lab rat. As long as you can turn it into DNA, it really doesn't matter what it used to be. We get our samples either uh, straight into ethanol or formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissues. Um, the stuff that's dumped into ethanol is good for DNA sequencing. The formalin fixed tissue is used for immunostaining, conventional staining, and uh, fluorescent in situ. And pretty much any tissue or fluid will do. So to present uh, two case studies that we've recently completed, these individuals are from the two opposite coasts of Canada. Um, BB stands for biobank. Um, BB3 was a 70-year-old male. Uh, he lived in a hyperendemic area of Nova Scotia. 
Uh, he was two-tier Canadian positive. Uh, he received standard 21-day treatment, um, as somewhat uh, painfully. Uh, he was, although he was two-tier positive, he was not able to get antibiotic treatment until he developed pneumonia, because it was acceptable for that. Um, he died shortly thereafter from coronary artery disease. BB4 uh, lived on the other coast of Canada in British Columbia, 69-year-old male. Uh, he lived in an area where ticks were known, but they were not considered to be uh, infected. He had a history of a bug bite, followed by a rash. Um, he had seven years of increasingly deteriorating health, uh, was really very ill. His Lyme serology, when he was tested seven years after infection, uh, was negative both in Canada and the US. Uh, he received no antibiotic therapy. Uh, during the course of being investigated for Lyme disease, they discovered metastatic Lyme, uh, lung cancer because he was a lifelong smoker. Presumably those were linked. Um, and that led to his death from medical assistance and dying. Prior to his death, he was very determined that uh, he contribute to Lyme disease research. Okay. So we used three approaches, which I'm going to take you through. One was DNA isolation and sequencing, and the other are the various staining processes. So we start with the ethanol submerged tissues. We got from both of these individuals tissues from a large number of organs, performed nested PCR, which has been just beautifully explained, better than mine. Um, it doesn't always look this good, but you amplify the DNA, you run it on a gel, and the little glowy bands show that there is DNA in all of these samples. So basically, every one of the tissues in this individual showed up. We tested number, number of genes to see what you can get. So we did this for both individuals. Uh, these are the tissues we had for BB3, the uh, pathologist on BB4. Uh, really did a lot of work, so we had a lot of tissues. We got Borrelia out of almost every tissue in BB3. He was the seropositive individual, and it was spottier in BB4, but again, we got Borrelia out of most of the tissues. One of the bigger surprises is that both individuals had a co-infection between Borrelia bassetti and Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, bassetti is not supposed to be in Canada. Um, and when I published that it wasn't there, it was allowed that it could be in Canada, but only in ticks. Okay, the next thing we did was look for a fluorescent tag to detect the DNA. Um, we can do this, the tags in a different way, both beacons or just conventional probes, doesn't matter. You get chunks of DNA that can find the complementary Borrelia DNA. They're fluorescently labeled. If you, take, if you inject mice so you know they're infected, uh, you get little glowy green things. If you look at a mouse that is not infected, you see nothing. So on one individual, all the little glowy things um, are present throughout, in this case is endocardium. In the other individual, you can see lots and lots of Borrelia present in his lungs. In both cases, we do see the odd vegetative form, but they tend to be present either as round bodies or these big lumpy things, which could be biofilm or could just be big lumpy things. That's the highly technical terminology. Uh, immunostaining is a classical technique um, used to detect things in, pa in pathology and histology. You essentially get an antibody to find the target, and then you make the antibody a different color. This is our positive control, where you see lumpy, you see colored bits that look sort of like spirochetes. Negative control shows nothing. Um, in BB3, uh, again, we see a fair number of spirochetes. They're present in the tissue, so it's probably not an artifact. BB4. Uh, they're really strange morphologies, um, funny looking things. I'm not very happy with the immunostaining on that one, but it could just be funny looking Borrelia cells. So for conclusions, um, in both of these individuals, 
there was infection present, uh, widely disseminated through the body. The fish staining and the immunostaining showed predominantly round bodies, but some spirochetal forms, vegetative forms, are also present. This worked in both seropositive and seronegative individuals, um, which is the bit where, when I've presented this to uh, our more, my more conservative medical colleagues, they start throwing things at me at this point. So if you're going to throw something, I like those cookies there. <laughs> Um, both of the individuals appeared to have mixed Borrelia and Bassetti infections, and in the one individual who was treated, it didn't appear to get rid of the Borrelia. In terms of significance, uh, I think this displays the possibility that we can use these molecular techniques to complement serology. This has already been brilliantly established at this conference. I'm really delighted to be here because it's such a science-friendly event compared to North America, so thank you all for that. Um, so that, in the practical side of things, that is still challenging. Um, obviously, in terms of treatment, working with autopsy tissues, there's no treatment significance. However, this can be used with biopsies, and I'm collaborating with a physician now who's where we're looking at different bits of basically clinical waste to see what works and whether we can get Borelli out of things that are not particularly essential, like hunks of brain. Uh, we can get things Borelli out of tissue that is less essential than your brain. Um, in this case, uh, one of the findings is completely consistent with serology and tick exposure. In the other case, it isn't. And down the road, this will offer the opportunity to address other research questions, such as what kind of damage, what kind of tissue damage, cellular damage, physiological effects are we seeing around the site of Borrelia in different organs. So with that, uh, happy to take questions, comments, criticisms, suggestions, all of the above. Thank you for this nice presentation. But you, you'd be hanged to say that Borrelia persists. Terrorist. You're a terrorist, you say that Borrelia persists. We'll, we'll make you an honorary terrorist with Christian I, I so appreciate being an honorary terrorist. I'm, I'm honored. Um, I, have, I would like to point out that the best thing about speaking to IDSA members about this is that they threw chocolate cookies. So. <laughs> Uh, a question, Alain Trottmann. Yeah. Uh, hello. Um, thank you very much, first. Um, you've shown us results that can be obtained only uh, on, uh, after death. Uh, I guess you might have looked at uh, other tissues that are more accessible on human beings, uh, living be yes. human beings like urine or skin. Have you yes. results with this? We're Working on skin now, um, also uh, mostly adipose tissue from cosmetic surgeries, because that appears to be available. In terms of culturing from urine, uh, other tissues, uh, blood, we're doing that as well, and we're developing that as something that's uh, friendlier to the living patient and more compatible with them re remaining alive. Would you agree that the PCR seems to be the most uh, straightforward uh, and uh, clear? Because for at least immunohistochemistry, which I like in general, yeah. doesn't seem to be the most clear cut. Uh, well, uh, immunohistology is as much an art as a science, and apparently I'm not an artist. Um, PCR, there are serious sensitivity issues. Uh, for me, actually, fish works very well, but it's reproducible anyway. PCR is good that way. Yes, question. Uh, just, just to ask if uh, you did uh, some tests on lymph nodes. Um, we know that in those diseases in different stages, lymph nodes are inflamed, so, and it is more accessible than liver biopsy or lung biopsy. Uh, have you done it on lymph nodes? That's a brilliant idea. I'll, I, 
I can't believe I'm about to say this, but I'll ask for some. <laughs> you know. Uh, so for the beacon, uh, yeah. we have beacons against Ospe flagell and flagellin. And flagellin, okay. Um, I like flagellin better. Um, so the images that you showed us with the with the beacon was it flagella? That was flagellin. That's yeah. excellent. Um, the beacon and the fish work actually about the same, but just a conventional fish probe is a sixth of the price of a beacon. So yeah. we've gone that way. Yeah, beacons are expensive. <laughs> Other questions? Okay. No? Okay, thank you very much.